Isaiah 49, verse 5. And now the Lord says, I mean, no, that's important. He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has, has been my strength. He says, somebody say he says. It's too small a thing for you to be my servant. This is what God is saying to Isaiah. To restore the tribes of Jacob, bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light. Underline, circle, highlight that. For the Gentiles, people don't look like you, act like you, dress like you. That you may bring my salvation, not just to church on Sunday, but to the ends of the earth. I want you to lock in with me the very beginning of verse 6 here where he says, it's too small a thing. And I want to talk to you for the next few minutes on that thought. It's too small a thing. Because one thing God will never say. You may hear him say, well done. Hopefully you do. Hopefully you don't hear, depart from me, I never knew you. Hopefully you'll, you'll hear a still small voice as a, as, a, as a kingdom man or woman. And God's voice will speak to you. One thing he will never say is, that's too big. God will never say that dream that you have is just too big for me. I'm intimidated by that. I'm not sure if I can handle that. He'll never say your prayers are too big. God will never say your faith is too big, your sacrifice is too big, uh, your, your giving, your offerings, your praise is too big. He'll, watch this. He'll never say that offense or what, that thing that happened to you or that person did to you is just too big to get over. He'll never say your differences with your coworker are just too big. No, it's actually just the opposite. God says it's not too big, it's too small. It's too small a thing. God, God told Isaiah, if you think I created you, watch this now. This is really my message here. I created you and called you to just be my lowly servant. To restore the house of Jacob is too small a thing. I've called you to be a light to the Gentiles. In other words, what he was saying, he said, if you think I created you and I took time to breathe life into you and form you and call you and get you to church on this Sunday morning just to merely be a servant to suck air and take up space and punch something on the clock like you did something and, and, and just slip a few bucks in the offering, shake the preacher's hand and you feel good for the week is too small a thing. I've called you to be a light in darkness. I've called you to go beyond the four walls of the church. And, and you know, uh, many times in the Bible, you'll find go. Luke 14, 23, go into the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in. Uh, you'll find Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Matthew 28, go, therefore make disciples. In fact, two-thirds of the word of God is go, right? And, and so we understand that Acts 1, 8 says, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you shall be my witnesses. Where? In church on Sunday? No. He said in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the other most parts of the world. Basically what he was saying is in Judea, Forney, in Jamer Samaria and, and, and Dallas, North, North Texas and, and, and the uttermost parts of the world. He said, I've not called you to just restore the house of Jacob. I've called you to be a light to the Gentiles too and your dreams are too small. Your, your little Christian little bubble is too small. I've called you to reach people that aren't like you. I've called you, watch this now, don't post things that you just agree with but understand we have all kind of other people to reach. Don't just hang out with with people just like you but be intentional about going to somebody at Walmart that's not your color and smiling at them and going out of your way to what we have going on here diversity in, in, in every area but in race is not something we just accidentally bumped into we've intentionalized this this is not tolerated it's celebrated and we are to go out into the dark world the darker the night the bright I'm preaching right now the darker the night the brighter the light and pandemic nothing uh, 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 reception nothing racism nothing mask or not mask nothing we are king's kids we are called to a different people we are a chosen generation we are a royal priesthood a holy nation a people belonging to God not to Democrat or Republican Party not to a color but a people belonging to God that we might declare the praises of him who has called us out of darkness 
into his wonderful light. Come on, take about five seconds and give God praise. I've called you to be a light to the Gentiles. He said it's too small a thing. As I begin to think on that phrase, I begin to think of a few areas that this could be applied to. It's too small. Too small. Our dreams are too small a thing. Our vision is too small. We've got to remember the God we serve. I mean, come on now. Slung the stars into existence. I've often said, put the blue in the sky, the green on the grass, and the corn on the cob. The heavens are his throne. The earth is his footstool. He's a bad God. Walks on water. Turns blinded eyes and raises the dead and wakes his own self up after being dead for three days. Some of you can't wake up after. <laughs> He's dead his own self for three days and woke his own self up. The prophet said, is there anything too hard for our God? And because we know the answer to that. I like what Charles Stanley, the pastor in Atlanta, has got on his desk in his office there in Atlanta. He's got a plaque that says these words, dream no small dreams, for they stir not the hearts of men. Your dream is too small a thing. If you think you can dream a dream that intimidates God, he says, try again. Dream bigger. I thought about that with this church. I'm like, God, you know, we got a little pandemic going on. And and I'm sure he was like, OMG. <laughs> you know, God, are you sure? You know, I mean, and, and, and it's, it's like, God, if you could just give us enough money to get in the building. If we can just pay the bills, man. If we, you know, if we can just raise the money to get the sound, the lighting. Doesn't have to be the best sound. Just if we can just get by. And I felt convicted this week. Yes, I did. He said it's too small a thing. It's too small a thing for you to pay the bills. I've called you to be debt free so you can speak to nations. It's too small a thing just to fill a building two or three times on Sunday and say, oh, wow, we got a mega church going on. We got thousands going on and a bunch of deadheads that are doing nothing through the week to influence a culture. He said, it's too small a thing. It's too small a thing to be having church and not be in the church. God's called us to establish a college, a next level university. And He's called us to develop a whole neighborhood where single moms and battered women and children can reside and they don't have to lower their self to the nice homes and be able to develop it and have a community pool that looks like a Disney resort hotel pool. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with dreaming big? Because if you're dreaming small, can I tell you if your dream is small, it ain't God? God gives big dreams. Because he's a big God. 1938, a 17-year-old boy selling popcorn in the ISIS theater in Fort Worth, Texas. He's a high school dropout from a very poor family. But God looked down on John Osteen. He said, it's too small a thing for you to sell popcorn the rest of your life. I've called you to reach the nations. In 1959... Mother's Day weekend, he started a church called Lakewood Church down in Houston and a feed store with 90 people. And he, he even made a statement. His son was telling this story, Joel, that he was satisfied and happy with 90. He never dreamed that 90 people would show up to hear him preach. He was just thankful for that. But God said it's too small a thing. They end up having conferences where eventually up to 150 nations would show up for one conference. But he still said it's too small a thing. Then they fill up multiple times a week in an 8,000-seat auditorium. And then he goes home to be with Jesus. And God said, it's too small a thing. Joel was like, man, me and Victoria were thinking if people would just show up, just we could keep this building filled. And then the opportunity for the compact center where the Houston Rockets played came open. And now they're reaching, I mean, they're affecting culture. Now, I know, you know, I know, what, you know, Christians sometimes. But, but I, I'm going to tell you what Jimmy Fallon says about them. I'm going to tell you what people that Will Smith says about him. He's affecting Hollywood and affecting a culture all because his daddy didn't settle for serving popcorn. This dream may not be about you. It might be about your kids. Come on, the greatest contribution you have on this earth might not be something you've done. It might be someone you've raised. So it's too small a thing. 
For God does any great thing, he always wants to give vision. Abraham, I want to do great things through you. Come outside of the tent. Look up at the stars. Look up down at the sand. I want to get a vision. Joshua, before I give you the city, I got to tell you, look, see, I've given you Jericho. I need you to see. Joseph, get a dream. Get a vision. And he came back and told his brothers and his daddy he got a vision before it ever came to pass. Our dreams are too small a thing. Our prayers are too small a thing. Come on, say amen, somebody. Our prayers are too small a thing. God God said, ask of me and I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance, the nations for your possession. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door be opened unto you. But we dream and we pray too small. Mark Batterson in his book, The Circle Maker, said, Bold prayers honor God, and God honors bold prayers. When's the last time you prayed something that that really caused you to be so nervous in the pit of your belly because you actually had the audacity to say it out loud to God? When you pray bold prayers and dream big dreams, God has a way of stepping up because guess what? He'll never be embarrassed by one of his own. He said, Isaiah 59, you speak it, I'll get your back. We're, We're too lazy spiritually. Uh, must not be God's will. No, you gave up in your prayer life. Our thinking is too small a thing. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. But if you'll elevate your thinking, you elevate your life. Ephesians 3.20, the scripture we're all standing on for imagine. God does exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask or imagine. But notice, he doesn't do all of that until you imagine. you got to think right. you got to get an imagination. I see God doing amazing things down the street. I see God not finished this year. I see Easter Sunday. We're having to, well, just, well you hold on for about another 45 minutes. We're going to add a service right on the fly. I can see the, 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 the line going all the way down to Windmill Farms on the service road because people can't get in this building God's not finished with us this year God's not finished with you but you got to get a vision for that teenager you got to get a vision for that business or that marriage or it'll, it'll never happen without an imagination first God always exceeds our expectations but it starts with our thinking I shared this story so many times in this church but I shared it this past week thinking that everybody's already heard it and they didn't so here I go. I'll share it with you again. The great Arnold Palmer, the golfer. He's over in Saudi Arabia playing golf with the king of Saudi Arabia. And actually wasn't playing with him. The king of Saudi Arabia came to watch him play. And, and it really impressed him. And they built a relationship, had dinner together. And the king of Saudi Arabia said, I want to, for our friendship, I want to buy you something. And Arnold said, you don't have to buy me anything. And he said, no, no, I want to buy you something. And that's a custom over there. You really know your friends if, you know, you give a gift. And, and Arnold Palmer said, I'll tell you, why don't you just get me a golf club? Why don't you just get me a golf club? You know, well, that'd be kind of cool. A golf club from the king of Saudi Arabia. He said, that's what I'll do. I'll get you a golf club. A few weeks go by. A certified package comes here in the States to Arnold Palmer's home. And Arnold said it was a certified package. It was real little. And he said, oh, I'm like, it's not a golf club. Maybe it's a pendant or a paperweight or some, a plaque or something. And he opens it up. And much to his surprise, it was a title deed to a golf club. See, everybody ain't heard this. <laughs> What's the moral of the story? Kings think different. Kings think higher. The king thinks more of you than you sometimes think of you. And Isaiah 55 says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. Stop settling for average. You're not average. Come on, I want you to reach down and feel your pulse right now. Come on, just feel your hands. Feel your wrist right there. That means you made it. You passed abortion. You passed being raised by, by a single mom. You passed uh, uh, trials and challenges and all the things you've went through to be here. I mean, you've been in wars. And, and, and uh, Dylan and Sarah, great to have you guys, by the way. Um, I want you to meet Leanne afterwards, Sarah. Where was I? And all of this, and you still got a pulse. If you got a pulse, you got a purpose. Don't miss this. If you got a pulse, you got a purpose. Stop settling for average. You're to die for. There's bigness in you. There's greatness in you. 
It's too small a thing to settle. Can I tell you, our problems are too small. Our problems are too small a thing. It's not too big for God. It, it might be too big for you, but it's not too big for the God in you. It, it might, well, Pastor, you don't understand. I got this doctor's report. It's a big deal. It's impossible. Not him possible. God's got it. Perspective is everything. When, when I, I fly out of DFW or Love Field or whatever, you see all those big buildings. You know, if you fly out of DFW, you see the Gaylord, you see MBC Suites, you see Fellowship Church, you see all these big, huge buildings, the shopping mall, Grapevine, I think it's called, over there. And, and it's just a lot of amazing big old buildings that are big. They really are. But the higher you go in that plane, the smaller those buildings get. Now, they're still the same size, but you just went higher. If you would stop maximizing your problem and start maximizing your God, the problems will begin to minimize. I'll prove it to you. David said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us, how do you magnify him? Exalt his name together. That's why we're better together. It's one thing to have private worship. We should all do it. But when you come together with God's people, forsake not the assembling of the brethren as some of the men are doing, but even the more as you see the day approaching. And when you get together, let us exalt his name together. And you, oh, magnify, you set up a telescope to the stars. The stars aren't getting any bigger. But your perspective of those stars get bigger. And when you, oh, magnify the Lord with me, let us exalt exalt his name together. There's power in this, guys. It's more than going to church on a Sunday and being religious and going to eat fried chicken and, and just having a good Sunday. It, there is power in what we do. Your problems diminish as you begin to maximize your God. Problems are too small a thing. I'm not being a lack of empathy. I'm not, I'm not saying you don't have real problems. But I am saying you can focus on the problem or you can focus on the promise. Now, the problem, okay, the problem is written with a pencil. The promise is written in ink. Problems are going to come and go, but my word remains forever. I'm preaching this morning. Somebody's going to get a hold of this, and, and, and you're going you're, you're, you're to start believing again for that marriage. You're going to start believing again for that family. You've already got a business plan wrote out, and you gave up because you were listening too much to what CNN and Fox and the stock market, ABC, NBC, CNBC, and woe is me is saying. But you've got to listen to what Jehovah Jireh is saying. El Shaddai, he's more than enough. He's able to keep the imperfect peace whose mind is set on you exceedingly and abundantly above all your your little mind can never ask her thing. Come on now. If you believe what I'm preaching, why don't you give God a 10-second praise phrase out of your mouth? Come on. Give him a shout. Let the demons of darkness and, and the doubt and confusion and discouragement and depression, watch it leave. Come on. Watch it leave. Somebody come to the music. You may be seated. Give me two more minutes here. Our differences are too small. Did you hear what I said? Now, you remember how loud it was just now, right? It's about to get real quiet when you find out it wasn't about the mask. It's about division. It's about to get real quiet now. Can you take the truth or are you going to get mad now? It's not about who's in office. It's not about race. It's not about cowboys or eagles. Have you not figured this out? Come on, guys. I refuse. I'm not talking down. I'm not being ugly. But Lord, I will not pastor Barney Five Christians. Do you even know who Barney Five is? Andy Griffith. <laughs> the fabulous Fife. I mean, you can't get nothing by barn. I feel like Christians are just getting it handed to them, man. You thought you really thought it was about race. It wasn't about race. It wasn't even about hate crime. They hate me because of my... It, wasn't, it was division. Because what are you going to do when Paul got a hold of this word in Acts, I believe, 13. I don't know where this is coming from. But when he actually got a word of this prophecy with Isaiah, and he said, if you think I'm going to hang out here in Jerusalem and talk about do we eat food or do we not eat food, do we, do we clean or unclean and all that, it's too small a thing. I'm not going to let your differences and your problem divide me from you. 
You can talk, say, tweet, post, whatever you want to say, and you're going to have to make the decision to split from me. Too small a thing. I've already settled it. Why is it we can have 325 things we love about a church? But the enemy will cause us to focus on that one thing. You know this is a bad church. You know we're doing some major things for the kingdom. You know we're taking ground. You know your family is better when you come. Mine's not. Yeah, you got to come every week. But Satan, because he wants to divide and cause you to be distracted and cause you to think that it's a big thing. Everything's not life or death, guys. You've got to choose. You remember what I've said before about a man chewing tobacco, right? You never slap a man chewing tobacco because you may win the battle, but you're going to have a mess on your hands. A pit bull could whip a skunk every time, but he's got to decide, is it worth the stink? Everything is not, you don't, did you know you can actually read a post on social media and just keep scrolling? Some of you had no idea. Raise your hand if you've ever changed the world by your post. It ain't happening. All it's going to do is cause division. And, and, and we'll just say, because it's, all, it's out there. Come on, it's the elephant in the room, the mask thing. Wear a mask, wear two masks, wear five masks. I could argue it both ways. If I had a sick, elderly a uh, parent living at home with me, I, I would be more careful. I get it. I get it. And, and, and only because what the media has told us, masks work, masks don't work. We believe the scientists. We don't believe the scientists. But I could also argue it the other way. But when it's all said and done, it's too small a thing. Well, it's life or death. So is hanging on the cross. Jesus didn't deserve that cross. He said, it's too small a thing. Our differences are too small. I can have all these things in common with Jeremy. And just because he doesn't agree with one little thing, Satan wants me to go south with him. He is my brother. Let's think about all the things we have in common. Well, uh, you suck air, the same air I do. You walk on the same dirt I do. You're a dad. Lord, we got a fraternity going. Um, you have two feet, two legs, two arms. I, same thing. Um, uh, you live in America. I do too. You live in Texas. I do too. But we never think about it. You love Jesus. I do too. We're going to go to heaven one day and live together forever. I, I, we're, uh, we have so much in common. But let's just make something up. Um, we'll get on the drinking thing. Now, we both stand the same way on this. But, but I, oh, I found out Jeremy likes, likes, likes a beer every now and then. I don't. My convictions are high, and you're too late to the party to tell me it's okay. I'm not saying you can go to hell. I'm just saying you're going to experience hell here eventually. But I'm not going to make it an issue, and me and Jeremy never talk again because he thinks it's okay to have a glass of wine with his wife. Come on, people, we're better than that. Can I be daddy just for like five seconds? Because all of you love it when I preach. Hey, your dream's too small. God's going to give you desires of your heart. Can I also tell you when we're wrong? We're missing it because we're acting just like the world. In fact, some of you taking more sides with people that stand with you the same way on politics, with the pandemic, with your race, than you do with the body of Christ and this book. It's the way it is. Take it or leave it. Our excuses for not serving God are too small. I'm done. Just listen to this really quick. Jesus told us in the parable, Pastor Trent talked about it last week, the king that put out invitations to everybody and immediately what happened? They all started making excuses. The king was inviting them to his house y'all and he said y'all come on because Jesus was from Georgia he said y'all right God's country and he said y'all come over and immediately people start making excuses why because they had no idea they had no idea the presence they were in 
we do the same thing. We make excuses. Well, I'm not going to church because I'm this. I'm not going to do that because I'm not. You know, I, I can't really do that. I can't really serve in the nursery because well, after all, I work with kids all week. So you'll do it for a paycheck. Well, I'm with kids all week. I got a million kids myself. Uh, that tells me you're good with kids. What's your excuse compared to the cross? Tithing, giving, sowing, serving. You know, I'm not getting legalistic or I'm just saying we miss it. We're not aware. Jacob said I was in the presence of God and I was unaware. I was talking to, to you this uh, Friday about the general. I won't mention his name, but I had the privilege of having lunch with him. And I won't mention his name because I don't want to disrespect him in case somebody... Um, I had no idea who he was. First time I ever heard his name was when I got introduced to him. We sat down for lunch. And uh, Maureen here, who's back home, by the way. Come on, let's give honor to where honor is due. And I know his wife's happy that he's back home. He told me at lunch Friday, he said, you had lunch with him? He's like the hero of Marines. You had lunch with him? Man, if I thought he was that big of a shot, I'd have got a picture with him, you know. I didn't realize who I was. We do that all the time. You have no idea what God is wanting to do here. And you're just thinking, well, it went five minutes too late. I mean, could we be like Jacob and be in the presence of God and unaware? God wants to do the unthinkable, unimaginable. No eye has seen nor ear heard stuff. Let's not miss it. Our excuses are too small. You can make excuses or make a difference, but you can't make both. Abraham and Sarah, they had an age problem. Moses had a stuttering problem. Samson and David had girl problems. Noah had an alcohol problem. Judas had a money problem. Peter had a faith problem. Lazarus had a health problem. He was dead. But, but in, spite of, in spite of all their problems... God used these people to accomplish his plan and purposes on the earth. What's your excuse today? 